Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to participate in this symposium. I think it's a utmost important tissue issue we're going to uh, discuss today. I will focus a little bit on one aspect which Tony addressed, osteoarthritis. I will try to talk a little bit about what are these central consequences we see in osteoarthritis, can we evaluate it, can we assess it, and will it actually eventually have an impact uh, on management. So these are some of the lectures we're giving around the world. So this is the agenda for my next uh, 15 minutes. Focusing a little bit on the problem, 14. trying to translate back to what we heard from basic uh, preclinical studies, translating it, to in, it into diagnosis of osteoarthritis, and then of course try to see how will that actually also translate into uh, management uh, procedures. So first of all, a little bit about the problem. I think we all know that damage or and the degree of damage uh, of the joint could be an ulcer, it could be endometriosis, it could be many of these different uh, diseases where there is a lag of relation or a lag of correlation between the actual damage and the actual pain. So for osteoarthritis, it's evident you can have a massive joint degeneration without significant pain or you may have a minimal damage, a min minimal joint degeneration or joint damage, but you may have a lot of pain. So, radiological techniques are not really providing uh, any information about which of those knees are, are painful. And if we look at the uh, population, I mean, there's very little correlation. I mean, the KL here is the kelgren lorenz so this is a grading of how much joint damage you see. And if you have a high number, a three or four, there's a massive joint uh, degeneration. If you have zero or one or two, it's, it's a minimal. And again, you can see that there's very little association between the degree of damage and the actual pain. So something else may actually contribute to that overall picture and that overall perception of chronic pain in the osteoarthritis. So, I mean, just to conclude here, for the individual patient, there is a very little degree of association between the joint damage and the actual pain. So something else is playing an important role. And here we come back to what Tony told you about. Here we come back to this issue that there may be some other sensitization processes going on which may play a role. And Sensitization and these kind of central mechanisms is not something which is specific for osteoarthritis. Today we, we just uh, use osteoarthritis as, as, as one area, but I mean it's neuropathic pain, it's all the other areas, all these areas, I mean they all show signs of different degrees of sensitization. So it is a kind of a general feature which we have to deal with. So, and again, coming back to the preclinical data, what is it? we actually see uh, in the animals when we talk about knee osteoarthritis. So here is just an example, just one single little slide showing what's happening if you have an inflammation of a joint in an animal. So what you will see down in the, the right lower uh, uh, corner is that there will be this kind of expansion. There will be an expansion of these so-called receptive fields, the area from where you activate your spinal neurons. So there will be an expansion, and on top of that, there will also be a sensitization. So now you need to apply less stimulus or less pain or less input to that area in order to provoke nociceptive activity in the rat. So you see an expansion, you see a lowering of the threshold, so you see some general consequences and you see some local consequences. So this is what we actually see in animals, and it's consistent across many of these uh, studies. So a animal joint inflammation model will show these changes. There will be localized changes and there will be these central manifestations. So the question is, can we actually translate that into patients with knee osteoarthritis? And we and many others, we have been working very hard on trying to profile patients and try to see if we can come up with biomarkers which can actually diagnose and classify and separate those patients uh, into different groups. So one technique which we have applied in the, in the laboratory and in the clinic is a question of trying to apply a standardized 
painful stimulus to different locations over the knee joint. And in this case here, we just try to apply pressure to many different locations. We actually take those pe pressure pain thresholds and we translate them into, in, them into these pictures. So the more red you will see, the, the lower pressure pain threshold. So the more red you see the knee, the more localized sensitization. So as you can see, the, the higher pain ratings, those who have a high clinical pain rating, they are also showing more of that localized pain hypersensitivity to this very standardized experimental stimulus. But if we go down on the lower panel, you have again this KL score, which again, four is massive joint degeneration, one to zero is minimal or no joint degeneration or no joint damage. And again, now you can see there's very little association between what we can measure of local sensitization and the degree of sensitization when we, uh, and the degree of, of, of damage when we evaluate it in, in, in this way. So again, the joint damage as such is not really predicting anything about how much sensitization do you actually experience when we apply pressure to this local uh, site, to the knee where you do have the pain. So again, something else must go on on top of that local sensitization. We have now tried to see, is, are there any specific subgroups of patients? I mean, we have been dealing with that in neuropathic pain for many years, trying to subgroup patients, see, okay, are there specific subgroup of patients responding to specific treatments? This has not been done so much in the muscle skeletal area. We have started now to look into subgrouping of patients based on some of these measures. And we and others today, we, we have looked into these subgrouping, and one specific group of patients is actually popping up. And this is this group with high clinical pain ratings, but very little do joint damage. So they have low calgren lorentz but they do have a lot of pain. So this has been a quite, kind of a mysterious group of patients, because fundamentally it, it's very, very difficult to explain why do they have all that severe pain despite the fact that there's nothing or very little going on uh, in the joint, actually. So, as you can see on this panel, they are red, so they have a high sensitivity to these experimentally applied stimuli. So, they show a lot of localized sensitization. So, there are subgroups of patients with osteoarthritis, and I think this is very important to understand, because such a subgroup may have another treatment as compared to another subgroup with, for example, less sensitization. So it's important to understand these features because we may use that when we look at the, in, for example, the importance of the descending uh, inhibitory control. So that's a little bit about the localized changes, but what's happening uh, generally? What's happening when all these changes occur, as Tony told us about, where the brain is starting to change the whole picture? So, again, the localized sensitization, we have the red areas. And then if we try to apply pressure or apply some other stimulations to other extra-segmental sites, what will now happen? Now you will see, actually, that these sites are also sensitized in specific groups of osteoarthritis patients. So it's not only something happening locally at the knee joint, but it's also something happening more general to throughout the entire body. And we have to remember that the descending inhibitory control is something which is affecting the entire neural axis. So there will be a general effect throughout, uh, throughout the, the entire neural axis. So a localized thing may actually trigger a more generalized uh, kind of hypersensitivity. And this is exactly what we see in the patients with this uh, spreading sensitization, or what we could call centralized spreading sensitization, which is most likely controlled by these descending inhibitory pathways, which are impaired. So one thing is this descending inhibitory control. The other thing is this wind-up phenomenon, as Tony told you about. We can also evaluate that in patients. We can also look for those sensitization processes 
going on within these, uh, the spinal cord. And that's, again, called wind-up-like pain, or it's called temporal summation in humans, and it's something which we can assess in the laboratory. And this is just an example where you apply repeated mechanical painful stimuli, and because of that central integration in the spinal cord system, in the spinal cord, you will see this attenuation and this enhancement of the responses. So the fifth pulse is causing much more pain as compared to the first one, although they are providing the exact same input to the central nervous system. But the central gain and the central facilitation here is actually amplifying that response. And you can see that this top graph here on, on, on is actually patients who suffer from high OA pain. The middle one is patients suffering from mild to moderate, and the green one are patients suffering from nothing. So they are healthy controls. So you can see the more clinical ongoing pain you have, the more facilitation of that central integration or that temporal summation or that what we could call wind-up-like pain. So the more clinical OA pain you have, the stronger we, we see these central facilitatory phenomenon occurring. So this is the other very important feature, the descending control, the central integration. So those two together are really playing a very, very important role in many, not only osteoarthritis, not only neuropathic pain, but in many of these chronic pain conditions. So, coming back to these descending inhibitory pathways, they play a role. We have learned that they affect the entire new axis. So, in healthy controls, those without any chronic ongoing pain, we have a lot of inhibition, we have very little facilitation. But in pain patients, it's kind of vice versa. We may have much more facilitation, or we do not have very much inhibition. So if we can either change the facilitation, turn that down, or we can increase the inhibition, that would be kind of a very good thing to do. So this is exactly what we try to do with pharmacological interventions or psychological interventions or many other interventions, we try to restore this balance because it's so important. It's so important for the development of chronic pain. It's so important for the development of chronic postoperative pain. And it's very important for many of these uh, features. So we know that these descending inhibitory pathways are driven by some of the monoaminergic pathways. So we have to attack them one way or the other. So now we have local manifestations, we have some of these central manifestations as the wind-up-like pain or the central integration, and we do have these descending inhibitory pathways. So this is exactly what we have to address. This is what we should try to aim at. And this is where drugs like the pentadol, as we discussed before, with dual action, interacting both with the input and the drive, but also with some of these central consequences. So I think this combination of actions is so very important. And we now know that there are subgroup of patients who are actually more likely to respond as compared to others, and Andrew Moore will come back to that a little bit later. So how do we actually translate this into uh, management? Well, I'm just showing you two slides. And uh, one is on the SNRI, the duloxetin study, because there have been studies showing, again, that duloxetin uh, which is interacting with these monoaminergic pathways, the descending pathways, most likely, trying to enhance that descending inhibition. And as you can see here on the, the orange graph here, you have an inhibition over time in patients with painful knee osteoarthritis. And what's happening then if we use tapentadol as the topic of the lecture today also, we see the exact same thing. The dual action is doing the trick. So we inhibit part of the pain by the opioid effect, and the other part, which has been enhanced due to the chronification, is dampened uh, by the NRI effect. So again, what we can see here is that when you compare it just to an opioid, whoops, 
Okay, oops. Just if you compare it to an opioid, we will see better effect when you use the dual action compound in patients with knee osteoarthritis. So the take home message is patients with knee osteoarthritis with chronic pain have local manifestations, central manifestations. These can be central integration, facilitation of that specific mechanism. It can be impaired descending inhibition. And it's not only in a way, it's in many other chronic pain conditions. So thank you very much to all my folks back home and thank you very much for your attention.